All right, let's, uh, let's pray real quick and just invite the Lord to catch our hearts and our attention so we can really hear a custom-designed word for us individually. Lord, that's my conviction, that when you speak, you've tailor-made the word for each hearer of it. And so, Lord, I ask that you would cause us to hear easily and clearly and receive with great joy. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Recently, a woman asked me, Pastor, do you teach and preach the full gospel? Now, you know, church veterans will understand that what that question really means is, do you welcome and invite the person and the work and all the gifts of Holy Spirit? But this is the answer I gave her. Well, when you see the real Jesus, whom John puts on display in the first two verses of his gospel, and when you agree with that Jesus about who God is and who we are, that's the full gospel. It doesn't get any fuller than that. Consider what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23. The church is his body, that is the body of Christ, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And then in Colossians chapter, nine, uh, chapter uh, 2, verses 9 and 10, For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ. So when John says in verse 16 of his prologue, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. He's telling us this is the full gospel. The full gospel is knowing that you were made from all eternity in Christ, in the Father, in the Holy Spirit. Nothing can take you out of that. And when you hear it, and when you see it, and when you realize it, that's when you know. I was created to be in this circle in this circle of divine love among the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And in fact, that's where I am. And, and this is what John announces. John announces that we are in this relationship of nonstop, never-ending, overflowing, abundant love that Father has for the Son and Son has for the Father, all in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We're right in the middle of that. Now remember... Right, Because we have seven prior weeks of this series on John. Remember, that's not just for people who go to church. That's not just for people who say they believe in God. That's not just for Christians. That's true of every single human being on the planet. Everything, all was made in Christ. Everything, all of it. And all of us are in Him. And He is in all of us. We're right in the middle of it. That's what John says. And that's when the darkness sidles right up next to us. And whisper hisses the lie. <laughs> oh, no, you're not. Oh, no, no, you are not. You see, God is holy, and you are a sinner, and nothing sinful can ever come into his presence. You are not in the middle of that relationship. You're separated. You see, the slanderer has darkened our mind and presented us with a solitary, angry God who is up there, beyond the vastness of the cosmos, watching us, disappointed and disapproving. So I'm going to go back to an analogy that I have been using for uh, the past few messages of the chairs, and this is just a way to help us think about what's true in the heart, the nature, and the character of God. Now, these two chairs represent, if you will, the picture of God that John presents us with. John says that father and son are seated in such a way that they are face to face in the anointing, in the presence, in the overflow of Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with, the Word was face to face with God, and the Word was God. The Word was face to face 
in the beginning. Now, here's, in contrast, what the Western Christian version of truth is. Western Christianity puts the chairs like this, side by side, kind of the way you're sitting right now. So, father and son are not looking at each other with infinite love. They're looking at you. And they don't like what they see. No. And so the father says to the son, look at the disgusting things those sinful creatures have done and are doing. Look at the mess they've made of my world. I'm angry and I'm holy and I cannot put up with it and I won't. Therefore, I'm going to pour out my wrath and my rage on sin and sinners and it's not going to go well for them. Unless, Father says, as he turns to look at the son for a moment. Unless, son, you go down there. You go down there and you, who have no sin, you take their place. And I'll pour out all my wrath and my rage on you, and the penalty will be paid. I will have, I will have been paid the ransom that I deserve. And then, if, if those people believe the right thing, if they say the right prayer, if they sing the right songs, if they read and interpret Scripture correctly, and, and this is no small thing, if by some fate of luck over which they had no control, they were born into a culture that actually acknowledges and sees you. God help them. They're Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, nothing. But if they're, if they're lucky enough to be born into a setting where they might take advantage of what you've done on their behalf, then, then they can be with us. The model of Western theology is built on the framework of separation. And so, in the framework of separation, as a result of that framework, well, Western theology has to create pathways back to God, a place that John says we've been all along. Now, I'm eight weeks into this series of messages on the first 18 verses of John's Gospel, his prologue. Now, from time to time, you may have noticed that I will express a thought and get all worked up. <laughs> pa Pastor Lee says, Ah, oh, you're speaking with passion, right? And I'll just tell you the lay of the land for me. You know, I, I have no shame in admitting this. I'm not proud of it, but I have no shame in admitting it. When I think of what John, in his gospel, shows us about who God really is and what he's really like, and I look at the distortion that has come through Western theology, it makes me mad. I get angry at all that I lost and all that was wasted and the many ways that the religious machine damaged my soul. And I just think it's fair for you to know that I do not regard this material that I am presenting to you from John's Gospel as value neutral, which is to say, I don't regard truth as something that exists on a smorgasbord and you can eat from this plate or you can eat from that plate and it's all good because it's all food and it's all true. It isn't a value neutral proposition and I know because I lived with the results of the Western theological model. Take a look at this good, good looking young kid. I don't know how old was I, seven or eight? Now, this was my age approximately when my mom and dad started going to a very conservative fundamentalist church about a mile down the road. Now, this is what this little boy was told. You're separated from God. He's really mad about all the sin in your life. 
You have done terrible things. In fact, you are a terrible, terrible person, and you deserve to go to hell. However, if you catch the safety valve pass of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins, then you can avoid the penalty you so richly deserve, Graham, of going to hell, and instead you get a ticket to heaven. Now I'm 60. I was what, seven or eight? I spent decades and decades and decades believing the things they told me. And they weren't true. So for me, this is not a value neutral conversation. And I would suggest to parents and grandparents in particular that when you are assessing the choices you make for your own children and how they're raised and the context in which they're raised, that it matters what you expose them to. It matters the setting. What God are they going to learn about? Are they going to learn about the God that is revealed in the Gospel of John and embraced and proclaimed by the Apostle Paul? Or are they going to be left with this God who comes out of a model of separation that requires the creation of pathways back to him when John says you're already there? So, I'm writing this sermon. I'm getting kind of hot under the collar all over again. So I had myself a little chat with God. And I let him know my feelings on the matter. I'm a bit worked up again. And you know what I learned? There is someone who's not angry. Guess who that is? God! <laughs> God is not angry. He, first of all, he's not impressed with my theological insights. And secondly, he isn't angry over how far afield we have fallen from where he is and who he is and what he's really like. He's not mad about that. And so I asked the question. I said, well, Father, how, how do you deal with it? How do you handle it when your children are so confused that we think we have to manipulate you to get your blessing, and we think we have to create ways to get back to you. How do you deal with that? And I, and I felt like he said, Graham, I just stand there right with you. I'm not in a hurry. I'm not going anywhere. I just wait. When you're ready, then the light breaks through, and you get up, and we go on our way. This conversation that I had in my interior world with the Father reminded me of something that the old uh, Pentecostal revivalist preacher, Iverna Tompkins, said. Something that I've always loved. She said, God will take you the easiest way you'll go. Right? God will take you the easiest way you'll go. I'm all worked up, but God is not all worked up because... If coming through the door of fear is the easiest way you go, the Father say, I'll take you there. I'll take you right there. If the easiest way you'll go is through the doorway of self-recrimination and shame and guilt, I'll take you right there. If the easiest way you'll go is through religious performance and acute pressure to do and believe and, and be all the right things, if that's the door you go through, okay, I'll take you the easiest way you'll go which is a great word of grace and hope because I didn't come to him the easiest way that I could have because while it's true that God will take us the easiest way we'll go not all of these doorways are equal there is a higher better more beautiful way and it's the way that John shows us and opens up to us in his gospel. It's the way that Paul presents to us, that's open to us. And it prompts for me a reasonable question. What does all this mean for the church then? What, what does it mean for us here at Wonderful Mercy as a community of faith? And I know that this is a question on someone else's mind because they wrote to me recently and they told me they were concerned that in my preaching during this series that my language about the religious machine might be misconstrued into me saying, 
I don't have any use for the church. But let me read to you what this person wrote. I love the series on our astonished heart, but one thing concerns me. I'm uncomfortable with how you speak about the church machine. The church is his bride, and he loves her. It could be confusing to speak about her that way. Surely we are the church. Can we distinguish between the true church and the clever disguise the enemy wants to show us? Vocabulary is significant. I know what you're getting at, but I don't want anyone to be confused. It's too important. I think that, that was a good word of reminder for me to be clear on what I'm saying. So let me just say it straight out. I have no condemnation for the church. None. And no condemnation for people who are caught up in the system, in the machine. But what I would like to say is that surely we can all agree and say out loud with some degree of honesty, recognize the madness of the machine, the madness of the institution and the empire. I was in Northern California a few weeks ago for a ceremony for my little brother who is in training to become a priest in the Roman Catholic Church, and he was moving from his philosophy studies in which they gave him a degree, and now he gets to study theology for four years before he becomes a priest. And it was a big occasion for him, and now he's able to wear the clerical collar, right? Now, the ceremony was held at his seminary in an absolutely drop-dead gorgeous chapel with the most amazing pipe organ and stunningly beautiful stained glass windows. And the archbishop, who is, he just knows my brother personally because everybody my brother's ever met, he knows personally. He's just that kind of guy. And the archbishop is proceeding down the, the aisleway, and he has this uh, beautiful garment on that is uh, just wonderfully colored and this, this majestic hat upon his head. And while I'm watching him process, aware that the beauty of the setting was assisting me in experiencing the presence of God, I, I found myself thinking, when Jesus was suffering the cruelties, the the brutalities on the cross. And when he was suffering crucifixion, this could not have been what he had in mind. He couldn't have been thinking as he was hanging on the cross, gee, I sure hope they get some really great hats out of this. Gee, I, I, I really hope that they have really great clothing for the people who are the most important and, and can show the separation spiritually of the leader versus the non-leader. Yeah, I really hope they spend a lot of money on buildings instead of the poor. I don't think there's anybody here who believes that's what Jesus had in mind. And, by the way, we're not exempt. These reflections caused me to go back and look at the photographs from my own ordination here almost 30 years ago. And there's a photo, I almost put it in, in the PowerPoint, there's a photo of four of us who are robed, four pastors now, a bishop, a friend of mine from the Presbyterian Church, the pastor who served here before me, and me. And we are standing in our robes, and all four of us are like this, with our backs to the congregation. Now, I understand the theological rationale and how theologians explain that. But I looked at that photograph, and I thought, that can't be what Jesus had in mind. Really? That is a picture of separation if I've ever seen one. We'll be turning our backs on you now. And the really spiritual, the really holy, the really important people will, will be in front. And all you'll see is our backs, which was all Moses was allowed to see of God. This stuff is more important than we know. And it leads to the question then, well, what about the church? What how then are we to be? Who are we to be, right? Well, I would say that the answer is one you have heard. If you've been around the church for a while, you've heard this about a hundred times. And so if you hear it again, it might just go and not have any impact at all. But I think the first task and the sweetest privilege of the church is proclaiming the gospel, is sharing the gospel such that 
when people hear it, they see who God really is, and they see who they really are, and they begin to have astonished hearts. Because this is the stunning revelation of the gospel, that the one who created all of us, the one who created all that is in the world, the one in whom all things hold together is in us, and we're in him. That's the stunning revelation of the gospel. My theological conversation partner, Baxter Kruger, says, when the gospel is preached, it astonishes the heart and ignites a conversation. Don't you think about that? If you take notes, write that down. When the gospel is preached, it astonishes the heart and ignites a conversation. And I was thinking about that statement from Baxter, and I thought, oh, well, there's an interesting opposite in my own experience. Take another look at me at seven or eight years old. Now, this is me surrounded by the religious environment and accoutrements growing up. On the right was the angry preacher. And my preacher, I thought, was angry all the time. In fact, I asked my God what he was, my dad, what this guy was so mad about. My dad says, what makes you think he's mad? And I said, because he's yelling at us every Sunday. When you yell, you're mad. Isn't he mad? Right? And then there's the Bible, rightly interpreted and understood and with the right translation. And then, to my, to my right, but looking at it on the left top, the fires of hell, which is where I deserve to go. And then just below it, the supreme mano a mano battle of Jesus and the devil. That was what I was fed. And so, as I'm now making this up, <laughs> at seven or eight, once I learned this, you know what I did? I went door to door in my neighborhood. And I knocked in the door of every house and I told them all about this. I told them all about this. And what, what, where I see the disconnect with what Baxter says and with what I experience is this. Remember, Baxter says that when the gospel is preached, it astonishes the heart and ignites a conversation. There was no conversation with me. They may have been astonished that a seven or eight-year-old kid was going around the neighborhood telling them all these religious things, but I was doing all the talking. I was doing all the telling, and I wanted to make sure they understood that my group had the right pathway back to God. And I was utterly bound by it. So I think Jesus would ask anyone, are you experiencing the glorious liberation that I promised? Are you experiencing rivers of living water flowing from your innermost being? Are you experiencing my kingdom, which is in you? Because if you aren't, you're experiencing something less than I intend. You can't read the Gospels. You can't read Paul and not be struck by the reality that something's happening that's so beautiful, it has captivated their hearts. And Paul actually says, now I probably, I don't know, this might not be an exaggeration. It might be a slight exaggeration. 500 times I probably either heard or read this statement from Paul. He says that when he preaches the Gospel, it is the power of God. I don't think I've ever really understood it before. Why is it the power of God? He's not saying the power of God is flowing through him. He's not saying he's the channel. He's saying the gospel itself is the power of God. Well, when you have a beautiful gospel, you have a beautiful God. And it's why elsewhere we are told that beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. This whole thing of being in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before the foundations of the world. It's all about beauty. It's all about the beauty that God makes available to us. I think all my life, even when I was seven or eight years old, I think I knew that there was something more beautiful. But every time I tried to get to it, I was grabbed back and made beholden again to the religious machine. You see, the religious spirit, the empire, it never lets you go. It does not release you willingly. You have to be delivered. You have to be set free. 
And as I was writing those words on the margin of my notes, it occurred to me that sermon that Jesus preaches in Luke 4 where he is opening the scroll of the prophet, I've never understood it before, but it's true. It's for me. Luke chapter 4, Jesus stands up and he preaches these words. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. All this activity in my life in these last few years have been the living out of that message of release of the blind and the oppressed and the imprisoned. And finally, now at age 60, I think I have a sense of what my mission is, if you will. And that is to help people see Christ in them, the hope of glory. That's the gospel. And that gospel is the power of God because it's actually good news. It's actually good news. I saw four boys sitting at the picnic table on Thursday of this week as I was getting ready to leave the church. I don't know, they're probably 12 years old. And they were just, you know, goofing around on the patio. And um, when I looked at them, I was struck by the difference in what I perceived now versus what I would have perceived 10, 20 years ago. I looked at them and I knew Christ was in them. And they are in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the darkness may have blinded them to that truth and reality of their being. But it's so. And I realized I actually had good news for them. Because you ask anybody who's been given the other version, the news is not very good. Not good at all. See, I think... As for as big a mess as my life is, for all the things you know about yourself that maybe most people don't know, maybe nobody else knows, and you look at that and you think, oh, that's a terrible thing about me. I think all of us know somewhere deep inside that the mess is not the true us. Diana Butler Bass writes in her book, Freeing Jesus, there is some good in us, however wounded, however damaged, however obscured, an intuition, a whisper, a memory of some other way of being. Sin is not our nature, rather goodness is. And that's true because we're made in the image of God and we're in him and we're with him and no one can take us out even if we don't see it. So a great father of the faith who later was convicted of heresy, so of course I like him, his name is Pelagius, Pelagius wrote this, You ought to measure the good of human nature by reference to its creator. If it is he who has made the world good, exceedingly good, how much more excellent do you suppose that he has made humanity fashioned in his own image and likeness? See, if you don't have a gospel that bears witness with your spirit in astonishment, you're left with yourself. And when you're left with yourself, then, well, you know what we have to do. Then, then we have to pretend that what we've created in our blindness is the real thing and is good news. And then we have to prop it up and put Bible verses all over it and then defend it, even, even to the death, against all comers. And it puts us in an adversarial relationship, not just with people who have no religious inclinations or upbringing, but with people within our own family of faith. Because our whole job is to demonstrate to them, to prove to them, that our theology, our experiences, our beliefs, our perspectives, our way of being is the right one. And it's better than this group and that group. And the other group, and none of us are astonished, and all of us are exhausted because we're all posing and just playing church. And that is not an accusation, it's an admission. Because I spent years of my life propping up 
the system. I can tell you why I did it. I can rationalize it and explain it, but it's true. So what does a healthy, life-giving church look like? Do you ever wonder that? I'm wondering right now because the staff is having conversations about this very thing. One answer is take a look around. This is what a healthy, life-giving family of faith looks like. It's where the gospel is rediscovered and proclaimed. See, going back to what my friend Baxter said, it astonishes the heart, the gospel, the good news, astonishes the heart, and it ignites a conversation. That's our job. That's your job. Having a conversation. When you're not astonished, when I'm not astonished, we've lost the gospel. When we're not astonished, we've lost the gospel. And uh, somebody will ask, am I saying that people don't have to go to church? Yes, I'm saying that. Because you don't have to go to a religious institution on a Sunday. But here's what I also think. I think because the news is so good, and because it's so astonishing to our hearts, we're going to want to be engaged in this conversation when we hear about it. And so we're going to reapportion our time. We're going to restructure our values. And we're going to give part of our weekend to being together, in our case on a Sunday morning, because we want to go deeper into this conversation. Because we know how powerful it is. It is astonishing to the human heart to learn that from before the foundations of the world, you were made by a God who loves you and you are in that God and no part of your life will ever make sense apart from Him. And it's not just the good parts of you that are in Him. It's all the mess. It's all the darkness. It's all the things we've ever done wrong. That's in there too. And God isn't disgusted by it. He's not afraid of it. He's not worried about it. He's standing there. He's not going anywhere. And when we're ready, then the light breaks through. And we get up, and we go on our way with him. Church is a people, not a place. Which means this whole enterprise is more exciting than we know because church happens just as easily on a golf course as it does in this building. And in fact, I think it requires us to move beyond these four walls. Not in some artificial evangelism attempt to get people to believe that our system, our pathway back to God is the right one. Not that. But we're out there in the world beyond these four walls because the news is so good we can't keep it to ourselves. The news is good for your neighbor who doesn't think God exists at all. Because the God that doesn't exist, that's the one whom he is in. Whom she is eternally loved by. And all the ways that are beautiful in her and him. The creativity. The kindness. The love. All of it comes from their design in his image. That's the beautiful gospel, revealing a beautiful God who when the gospel is presented, it astonishes the heart and it ignites a conversation. We don't, we don't criticize, condemn the church. You and I, we have all had some pretty extraordinary experiences in the institutional church, right? There were real experiences of the real presence and life of God, and thank you, Jesus, for it. But you know and I know that when those things are happening, we frequently get off track because the institution uses those experiences to validate itself, to validate that particular church or that particular minister, rather than to put the heart and the nature and the character of God on display. This is where I think we are right now in history in North America, in Christianity. We are rediscovering that we are in God's love story and that from all eternity, we were made for him, to be with him, to have his life flow through us. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. The word was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. 
Apart from him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to those who received him, to those who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of a human decision or a father's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and lived among us for a while. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who comes from the father full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, The one who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the abundance of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. But God, the only Son, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. This is the good news. This is the gospel. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to plant the gospel deep in our hearts so that we can break free of all the ways that we play church and actually be the church so that we can think creatively with you given your heart for the world given the good news entrusted to us that we get outside of these four walls and we may not know now what that means lord but we give you permission to put everything on the table and show us because you are excessively good offensively loving relentlessly kind would you cause us to be kind and loving and good even as you are pastor lee would you come and bless us